And so I feel like the church has to be right in the middle of what's going on, expecting with our words and guidance from the word of God. And as I was praying this week, the one thing that kept coming up, I guess about halfway through the week, I stopped watching the news, and uh, I would read it from here and there and, and possibly upload something, that an article that I thought was good. And then toward the end of the week, I didn't want to see anything. And one of the things that kept rising up, I think, from the Holy Ghost was the word truth. One of the things that's missing in this whole thing is truth. And when I thought of that one word, truth, I thought about Jesus before Pontius Pilate. And they brought Jesus before Pilate. And I want you to hear the conversation that Jesus had with Pontius Pilate. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. That's mob rule. What we're seeing today in America is mob rule. Or the mob trying to rule. And there's different sides to this mob. But the mob, the anarchist, on both sides are anarchists. Now, intermixed in both sides are peaceful protesters that are out there uh, basically to protest and to give their opinion. They're not out there to beat each other up with bats and knives and guns. But because there are two sides and... On both sides, there are people that have come not to join either of the anarchists, but for basically freedom of speech, no matter if that freedom of speech agrees with me or not. It's the first uh, amendment of the Constitution is that we have freedom of speech. But they began to yell, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, you take him and crucify him. And because I find no fault in him. There's no reason that I can find to crucify him. And the Jews answered and said, we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die. Because he made himself of the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. And he went again into the praetorium and he said to Jesus, where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. And Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you have no power at all against me unless I have been given it from above, or it's been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes him a, himself a king speaks against Caesar. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, and he sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And now it was the preparation day of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered and said, We have no king but Caesar. And then he delivered him to the, be crucified. So they took Jesus and they laid him away. In one of the instances here, in uh, John chapter 18, Jesus is talking to Pontius Pilate. Let me see it here. And he says to Pontius Pilate, 
that my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king? And Jesus said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? See, the problem that we have today is man wants to make up their own truth. And when you make up your own truth and you know you've made up your own truth, you will ask the question, basically, what is truth? What's true for you may not be true for me. That is not truth. Truth is true for everybody. And this camouflage of truth that we have in our culture today has been going on for a long, 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 long time. It's been going on longer than Pontius Pilate because in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and the devil came to Eve and said, uh, you know, did God really say? He could say, you really believe this is true, that if you eat this fruit, that you will surely die. If you eat this fruit, you're going to become like God. Devil began right there twisting the truth and trying to shape truth to his own desires. And it caused the fall in the garden. And over 6,000 years now, it's continued. And we're at where we're at today. And the world and the earth is in its birth pangs. That a woman has before childbirth, but it's just the beginning. In Second Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul gives us a description of the last days. And all this takes place because of one thing that is absent, truth. If anybody was to ask me, what is the most important thing that we need in our world today? Or what would you recommend to solve our problems today? It would be truth. And in 2 Timothy 3, it says, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Those who love pleasure do not want to know the truth about the end result of forbidden pleasure. They want to live as they did in the days of Noah. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Listen to this. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. From such people turn away. For of this sort of those who creep into households and make captives of the gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because they're not getting the truth. They're learning, but they're learning with falsehoods. In World War II, Winston Churchill made his now famous statement, and I quote, in wartime, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. I'm going to read that again. In wartime, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. And while Churchill's remarks 
perhaps refers more to deception and secrecy. It does at the very least imply that truth is such a precious commodity that it should be zealously guarded lest it fall into the wrong hands. Our culture is one of lies today. Not to bodyguard the truth, but to hide the truth with intent to slander and destroy for personal and ideological advantage. We have, in this culture, allowed secularism to bury truth and to hide truth to get their own cause. Truth is the narrow road to liberty. Truth is the narrow road to salvation. Truth is the narrow road to liberty in a free society. And as we see today, if lies become the governing body, it will lead to the demise of liberty and the destruction of the American civilization. Our politics has turned into politics of lies. And they excuse it by saying, well, it's just politics. We now have seen elections spend over a billion dollars for the presidency, and it's just lies. Not looking to see who can best lead this country, who has the best character, but making up stuff so that people will have a hard time finding the truth. It's told that truth went down to a stream one day and undressed for a cool, refreshing swim. But truth went skinny dipping that day. Because while truth was swimming, a lie came along and took off his clothes and stole the garments that belonged to truth. And the lie dressed himself in the garments that belonged to truth. And lie paraded himself through the streets of the city dressed as truth. A lie dressed up like the truth. Many of the people were impressed with the lie. The lie was so splendid and beautiful. He looked and he sounded wonderful. A lie dressed up like the truth. And when truth stepped out of the water and found his clothes had been stolen, truth had to make a choice. He saw the garments of lie. And truth said to himself, I would rather walk around naked than to walk around as a lie. I'll just have to be what I am, the naked truth. I read that and I said, that's me. I'm going to have to be what I am. The church of Jesus Christ is going to be, have to be what she is, the naked truth. Oh, what a wicked web we weave when we practice to deceive. We're seeing this wickedness in America and the West today. And Isaiah 59, 14 says, so justice is driven back. Justice is driven back. And righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. That word, righteousness, stands at a distance. Justice is driven back. Order, justice is order. Order is driven back. And righteousness stands at a distance. Those that are uh, wanting to portray righteousness and are right with God and do that which is right, they stand at a distance. Truth one translation has stumbled and fallen. Another translation is truth lies dead in the streets. But if you look it up in the Greek, it would have said, one of the words would be stumble, fallen, cast out, has been cast down into the streets, and honesty cannot enter. 
One of our problems in this nation today, one of the greatest problems is that honesty cannot enter the debate. We need to be careful that we do not try to shape truth to our desires. Truth's greatest work is holding men accountable. Truth is not there for us to put it under a fire and try to bend it and not break it, but bend the rules just a little bit more and bend truth a little bit this way so that it fits and supports our chosen desires. Truth is truth and it stands alone and many times it has to stand naked because lies have stolen its clothing. As I was preparing this, I, the Lord took me to John 17, 9. We're not going to solve this problem without the word of God. And this message that I'm preaching today, the world will not receive it. I'm not preaching to the world. I'm preaching to the church of Jesus Christ. The world is acting like the world. Sinners are acting like sinners. The ungodly are acting like the ungodly. Now, I don't care if they name the name of God out there in their anarchy, in their hate. God is not in it. People have always tried to use the name of God to justify their anger and their hate and their violence and their bigotry. But this is for the church of Jesus Christ. We have no fight against one another. John 17, 9, the prayer of our Savior, and he says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you've given me for their years. I'm not preaching to the world. I am preaching to the church of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching to me. I can't help the world until they bend their knee to Christ. I have nothing to give the world until they bend their knee to Christ. Everything that I will say today will go against everything the world stands for because they're at war with God. And Jesus said, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they're yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Now, I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I have come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. There are people who are going to want you to pick sides, but we are on the side of God. We want to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. It's not going to happen until Jesus Christ returns. But our job as Christians is to represent another kingdom. I've given them your word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by truth. Set them apart by truth. We're different because of truth. And even the church has been guilty of living ungodly because we've even buried truth in our own churches to get our own desires. The truth is truth. It can only stand at one angle. 
G.K. Chesterton, I think, said that man can fall at many different angles, but he can only stand straight at one. And Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus said, I pray that the body of Christ will be one so that the world will see and believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That the world may know. This is one of the moments in human history where the world needs to see the church of Jesus Christ as followers of Christ and as a family united through the word of God. We really have no opinions. We have the word of God. We have truth. We have liberal scholars that have taken this word and buried it with lies because they didn't want to offend. Guess what? Truth offends. I don't want to offend anybody on my own. But if being a follower of Jesus and believing in his word offends, then it offends. That's not my intent. My intent is love because God's word and God's ways are always for the goodness of man. God's word and God's ways are always for the humaneness of man. Why well, he says to give water and food to our enemies. We have an opportunity that we can have compassion upon them. We are to have compassion upon them. We have an opportunity where we can help them. We are to help them. True Peaceful life is the life of covenants. When it says, how can man walk together except, how can two walk together except they be in agreement? That agreement that they walk together with is called covenant. Man has to be in covenant to walk together. Man has to be in covenant to live together. And we can only be in covenant with one another if we live in covenant with Jesus Christ as Christians. We don't make our own covenant. We don't make our own rules. We come into covenant one another because we've come into covenant with Jesus Christ in his words and his ways. In America, if you want to look at covenant, you would have to look at our Constitution. Our Constitution is really a covenant that is made with the American people. If we want to live in peace, and if we want to live with fairness and justice, we have to live under the covenant of the Constitution. That's why even when there was slavery in America, it went against the Constitution. It was against covenant. And the strongest thing that man had to tear down slavery. I'm talking about secular men. The thing that they looked to was the Constitution. As a Christian, I believe the highest truth is the Lord Jesus. As a follower of truth, Christ is truth. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And as a follower of Christ, truth is held in the highest of regards. As a follower of Christ, truth is elevated. Righteousness is elevated. Being humane is elevated. 
If I try to add to the truth of the lie, I destroy my credibility as a believer. If I try to exaggerate and try to make something what it really isn't in trying to tell the truth, I have destroyed even the truth that's in the story. One of the things that amazes me about this book right here is God didn't do anything in here to try to make himself look good. He told the truth. David speaks the truth about himself in the Psalms. And today, we think truth is too boring. Truth needs to be embellished. Yeah, I, I, I did do this, but it doesn't really sound, it's not real exciting, it's boring, and I don't know if it'll really get my uh, desires accomplished, so I'm going to embellish the truth. And so you have a little bit of truth, and it's really truth, and it's really something that's good, and, but yet you begin to build around that truth lies to really make it look even greater than it was and it's great anyway. And what happens is when the lies are seen, it just destroys anything you've ever done. It's destroyed your credibility. It's destroyed your ability to communicate the gospel to anybody because they're going to say, why should I believe you? This word is truth. If anybody could prove to me that this was a lie, then how do I know to trust any of it? I believe this book from cover to cover. And the thing about it is that when we as Christians get involved in this culture war with the truth of the word of God and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the world thinks that we're supposed to have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. And I'm not here this morning to paint a pretty picture and to say that, you know what? We're going to rise above this and we're going to do away with racism. Racism will never be done away with. I saw one preacher putting on Twitter that he prays that it's this generation that ends racism. This generation is not going to end racism. It has been here since man. And it will be here till Christ returns. Man is fallen. This entire generation is not going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And everybody that goes to church doesn't know Jesus as Lord. The Bible says in Matthew 24, in the last days, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and nation will rise against nation. That word nation is ethnics. Not just a black and a white thing. Go to Europe. Look at Ireland. It's a Catholic Protestant thing. People of different cultures and backgrounds defending their own culture and background. Well, guess what? When you get to America, it becomes a troublesome thing because now we have a pluralistic society with different cultures and different backgrounds and everybody jockeying for their own. So how do you deal with a pluralistic society that now holds all religions as the same? You've got to have debate. Not anarchy, but debate. And the church has to be right in the middle of it presenting the truth claims of Jesus Christ. The answer is not to take the Ten Commandments down from the courthouse. The commandment, I mean, the, the solution would be let everybody come down there and present their case. Because God has never been afraid of hiding or hiding to let somebody else challenge. He, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You can put the word of God and God himself under scrutiny. A secular man wants to do. I'm not afraid for people to look into the Christian faith and to dig deep into the word of God. And when they find things down there that I can't understand that they think is abhorrent, 
I know God, and I know he's good. And I know that all of his actions are good. And even though I don't understand now, I trust his goodness. I trust who he is. And now, because I trust him, I can trust him with my answers. And I can look at somebody and say, I don't have all the answers. I've got a real good start for you. That is, if you name the name of Jesus, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, then follow Jesus. But do not go to church and claim to be a follower of Jesus and live like the world. We have to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. In this pluralistic society that we have today, I mean, it's, it's here's the advantage the centers, sinners have. The advantage the sinners have is they're serving the same God, Satan. Now, we know that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, but we've got other contending faiths, even though they're false. But you have convictions of morality. You have convictions of a sovereign God. You have convictions of the one and only true God, and you're not going to be moved by those convictions because they're not preferences. Your truth that you hold is absolutes, cannot be altered and changed. And you cannot get to the point where you say all religions lead to the same place because you would be denying your faith. So that puts us in a quandary in a pluralistic society. And the answer is not to make it a secular society because secularism today is a religion. But it's to have a debate. Put truth out on the table. Find out what is true and what's false. John 8, 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Christ is speaking of himself and salvation, but truth is truth, and it also it's true in society. Truth is... I was at a courthouse several years ago, a girl that I knew in the church, her and her husband were trying to adopt her son from a previous marriage, and her previous husband was a drug addict and a wife beater, and he'd been in and out of prison like six times. The kids had grown up in her home with her second husband. And the husband gets out of jail another time, and he wants joint custody of the children. They don't even know this man. They've not spent two weeks with this man. And he gets out of prison, and he wants them for the summer. Now, you're asking these two boys, still young. I think the oldest at the time might have been 10. The youngest was probably 5, 6 to go spend an entire summer with a man they don't even know who is a drug addict and a wife beater. And they were going to court, and even while the the case was still in the courts, he tried to run her off the road and kill her with the kids in the car. And so I went to support her at the courthouse. And I sat there and listened to the testimonies. And I'm telling you, this guy doesn't have a case. This guy, there is no repentance in his heart. There is just evil and arrogance. And he could not be a good father. And these couple were Christians, and they were raising their kids in a steady, stable home. And... The husband's lawyer had these two Christians go take drug tests because he was accusing them of being drug addicts. And they went and took a drug test. They knew they would pass it with flying colors because they'd been saved for years now. And the drug test came back positive for marijuana. And I said, look me in the eye. And tell me the truth. 
And they said, we have not touched it. We don't know what has happened. But I can tell you that we do not do drugs and we do not smoke marijuana. We don't even drink. And I said, I believe you. And there in the court case came back from the lab that there had been a malfunction in their machines and many, many people's tests came back positive for marijuana that wasn't positive. It was a malfunction of the machines. And their lawyer wanted to bring it into the case so the jury, jury could hear it because the jury had already heard that these people, if they found marijuana in their blood, they're liars. And so when, during the middle of the court case, the, her lawyers came forward and said, we want to present this evidence, the other one said, no, we can't allow them to put that evidence in there. The, the court is already going on. And the judge had to side with that group that this new report cannot be added into the case. And the father got joint custody of the children. And the judge in the case knew he was guilty and she let it be known. And she said to him, you break your parole in any way, then I will re-rule without a jury that this woman will get full custody of these children and they can adopt them. And he was smug. And his lawyer was very proud. And his lawyer didn't know who I was. He just knew I was sitting in the audience. And he came over and he greeted me and he said, what do you think? I said, I think disgrace has just happened in this courtroom today. And truth has fallen. I said, you see this building right here? It is a building for justice and a building for truth. No matter when the truth comes in, truth should be presented. Because what we're really after is the truth. And I said, I believe that if I would have handled this case, I would have destroyed both you and your client. Oh, you're a lawyer? I said, no, I'm a preacher. But you can say I'm a lawyer, I'm on retainer for God. And I said, you're a disgrace to the practice of law in this nation because it's not about truth, it's about winning. O.J. Simpson was overwhelming evidence that he had killed two people. And he was found innocent. And... There were some in the African-American community that was cheering in the streets in front of the courthouse. We finally got by with one. We finally got by with one. Knowing he's guilty. Not about color. It's about truth. Everyone, whatever color, that come under the law has to be treated according to that law. The truth will make society free. And now we have so covered and hidden truth that in our court system, we're not looking for guilty. We're not looking for innocent. We're looking for what's the best way to satisfy the crowd. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He was an innocent man according to their laws. And Pilate says, here he is. Beaten, flogged, crucify him. Because that's what the crowd wants. And truth died on the cross that day. But truth always rises. Truth never lies dead. Truth rises. And sometimes when truth rises, it's just like it's just too late for those who destroyed it. So you, you try to destroy truth. You, you try to destroy Christianity. You can't destroy either one, but you'll destroy everything else in the attempt. You don't, you don't have a church with those lies. You don't have a society or a country with those lies. But before you know it, you have destroyed the whole thing. But you see the truth now. The American experiment cannot succeed without covenant. 
And there can be no covenant without truth. Because truth is cutter blind. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is accepted and lived, truth is elevated. Life is elevated. The sacredness of life is elevated. We don't just take life through murder. There is a punishment. And there is a debate. If they want to debate out there about the death penalty, I can debate it biblically. That the reason that we as Christians, at least me, now Catholics will differ with me, that's fine, we can debate it. But the reason I support the death penalty is because I believe life is sacred. And there is a difference between taking a sacred life and holding a guilty life accountable. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, it says, This is the message that we have heard from him and we proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, when you hold somebody accountable to this word right here, they're going to say, thou shalt not judge. Every one of us judges every day. We live our life by judgments. We trust or not trust people because of judgments that we make. And by the way, when those say you're not supposed to judge, they're judging me. Can't get around it. As a matter of fact, it's, you cannot condemn somebody. Nor would I want to condemn somebody. When Osama bin Laden was killed, there was dancing in the streets in America. I wept in my living room. Not because Osama bin Laden was killed, but because men were celebrating the death of another man. Oh, I believed in what we were doing. And I believed that he needed to be taken out. But it was not something that I was happy about. Because life is sacred. Even the ugliest life is sacred. And it wasn't a time for rejoicing. Yes, I was glad that he was no longer a threat of killing innocent people. Just like a Hitler or a Mussolini or a Stalin. I did not mourn the death of Osama bin Laden. If I'd have been old enough on some of these others there in Vietnam, I wouldn't have mourned their death. When I read about Stalin and Mao and even Kim Jong Un, if he were to be killed today, I would not mourn his death, but I would not celebrate it either. Because man's created in the image of God. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. One thing that is absolute in this whole thing going on in America right now is the church of Jesus Christ better get right with God and walk as one. Not a black church, not a white church. The church of Jesus Christ. I do not believe this, I call it a half, it, it's not even a half truth. That the most segregated place in America is on Sundays in churches. You don't even know why people go to the churches that they go to. I know in Shreveport, Louisiana, our church was 50% black and 50% white. I'm sure that some parts here in Texas is probably 50% Hispanic and 50% white.
But you're going to have churches that are all black. You're going to have churches that are all Hispanic. You're going to have churches that's all Korean. You're going to have churches that's all Chinese. Not because they're racist and segregating themselves, but it's because of a culture. It could be, I know people that don't go to some churches because of the music. And I'm not talking about soul music. That's my preference, rhythm and blues. But no, it's just the music. But to say because you go to a church that maybe is all black or all white or all Latino doesn't mean that that church is a racist. Truth has to be sought. I'll tell you this, the most unified church, not integrated, integration is like forced. You're ordered to now come together. That never works. Unity among the races is always in a spirit-filled church. Predominantly. There's probably some out there that's maybe not spirit-filled, but everyone that I've ever been in in my lifetime, they have been spirit-filled churches. People that believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the miracles, the gifts of the Spirit, speaking with other tongues. I think the church in New York that we love dearly and that we have their weekly prayer meetings on our website, Tuesday night prayer. I think they've got something like, I don't know, 100, 180 different nationalities in their church. So you think that he has to deal with this. He's got to use truth because everybody will be held accountable to that truth no matter what color of the skin, what background, what language they speak. We as Christians cannot shade the truth of God's word when culture is pluralistic. The light must shine brighter in the darkness. Racism wears many colors. It's not just one color or one culture or one creed. Racism wears many colors, but truth favors all colors. Truth is for the good of all men. All men are created in the image of God. And as Christians, we cannot shape truth to fit the achievements that we desire. We cannot shape truth for our selfish desires. When God puts forth truth, it's for all of society to live under because this is the best way that you can live as fallen man. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, we become the body of Christ. And with Christ being the head, yes, we have many colors. We have many tongues and many different backgrounds. But we become new creatures in Christ. We have a new kingdom that we serve and a new king. Yes. And it makes us one people, one peculiar people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. A Jewish people, God's chosen people. They've been scattered all over the world. They have been persecuted. They have been enslaved. They have been beaten. They have been murdered and gassed. They have been hated. They have been bombed. And yet, in all the places that they've been, scattered, one thing remained the same. They knew who they were. They never lost their identity. They were Jews. And in 1948, they went back to their homeland. From different cultures, all over the world. And they came together as one, as God's chosen people. But they never lost their identity. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And no matter where we're at or what's going on around us 
or if we're being persecuted or not persecuted, there's one thing that has to stand, and that is that we never, ever lose our identity. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And we cannot allow secularism and their lies come into the body of Christ and divide the body of Christ. We're not followers of anybody but Jesus. We can praise other men for their actions and their deeds and we can condemn men for their actions and deeds for society's sake. But we're followers of Jesus. And if we walk in the truth and the light, we will have fellowship with one another. The world can have none of this. It comes only through a born-again experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And where Christians have failed in this, it was not Christ's fault. The fault lies with the believers who failed to walk in the light. The confrontation that you would see, say, in Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants, this is not the church of Jesus Christ. If they were walking in the light, there would be unity. But they're being influenced by selfishness and greed and ungodliness. And as I said when I started, when I... What I'm preaching this morning will seem like foolishness to the world. But to the church of Jesus Christ, this must be seen and accepted as covenant. Black and white, yellow and brown, all who name the name of Jesus must walk in the light as he is in the light. Even if it causes us to walk in the naked truth. This doesn't settle it all. This is the beginning. Some would say, well, well, when you, what about wars? That's another subject, but there is just wars. And just wars are based on truth. And what's going on in America today and the world, you see, image is everything. Truth has been replaced by images and packaging. Our technology is such that they will just put an image, and image destroys any kind of words. They can create whatever image they want to create and convey any message they want to convey in its images. Yes. We used to, as Robbie Zachariah said, look through the eyes. See through the eyes with conscience. Now we just look through the eyes without conscience. In the media and imaging, people can basically put whatever they want to get any message they want to make you look at it and think, well, I can believe this. Mm -hmm. Dig a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Be careful what you retweet or repost. Check and double check your sources. If you've never heard of this person or this paper, I don't repost it. If I see several that have carried the story and I've checked it out, I'll repost it. I don't know how many people I've said, take that down. It's not even true. I remember when I was in college, Crest, toothpaste. Somebody had come up with this thing that they are Satanist and they've got this also this half moon on the toothpaste and, and you should stop brushing with Crest. Crest had done something that maybe that this Christian group did not like and everything and I began to investigate it and Crest was not even not, clueless. But lies were presented. Truth was bent. 
Dress was not a godly place. But truth was bent to make it look ooh, a little bit more than it should have looked. To get people to stop buying this Crest toothpaste. I remember in the 80s where we, they had guys traveling doing backward masking because they'd take a, an album and they'd play it backwards and say these were satanic worshipers. This is what they're saying backwards. And they play the record backwards. I never did get into that. And my thought at the time was I don't have to run it backwards. I can listen to it in plain English and tell you that it's not good. But it had nothing to do with really the truth. And what happens is you lose your entire credibility. Compromising preachers and compromising churches that go with political correctness or go with the culture, they lose their credibility. But even that person, the most ungodly that is consistent, at least they have credibility of being consistently wrong. I want to have a reputation of consistently standing for the truth. Yes. Even when it leaves me naked. time for the church of Jesus Christ to become one in the spirit one in the word one in the Lord they shall know that we are Christians by our love and when they see the only fabric of society that cannot be torn apart is the body of Jesus Christ there are those out there that don't know the Lord will see this and go I believe because the church did not tear themselves apart in this time. They stood as one. Black, white, yellow. That's what we need to have. We need to have revival where we're seen all together as one. Condemning any type of racism with whatever color it's wearing and whatever name it's calling itself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I can tell you today, if the leader of ISIS today became born again, born again, I would love him like a brother. I would welcome him. I'd embrace him. And if he ended up going to prison and facing the death penalty, I would be with him and look forward to seeing him in heaven. This is ISIS. One simple change. What you believe about God will change everything. It speaks about you in every way. What you believe about God. And so we cannot get caught up in this secular hate. That's the media's job. They make money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And what you're seeing on our streets today, if you dig deep enough, look for the money. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray for a move of your spirit upon your church. 
I've got to believe God that there be more with us than they that be with them. That if every pulpit condemned racism of every color and of every name and to seek truth wherever it led us, truth that God that we would live in peace. We're never going to be one spiritually unless they make Jesus Lord. But we can live in peace. Racism and bigotry and hate. There are no laws that can eradicate it. It's in the heart of man. And they need a new heart. And you're the one that renews our minds but gives us a new heart. I pray for spiritual awakening to swallow up the anarchy. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <sighs> I told my wife.